Hello, Psych 100 General Psychology students. This is Larry Hatcher. We are in Unit 5. This is Module 3, Obsessive Compulsive Disorder, OCD. If you're watching the online video of my lecture, you should have in front of you the document that contains my blanked out lecture notes. Uh, to download this document, log in Canvas, go to Psych 100, go to the module section, select the module headed P100, Unit 5, Module 3, OCD, then locate and open the documents titled P100, U5, Mod 3, Lecture OCD. I saved it as Word doc as well as PDF. Although it has most of the lecture notes you'll need for this module, I blanked out some terms here and there by watching this video. You'll be able to fill in the missing words so that you'll have a complete version of this module. And the module is Module 3, Obsessive Compulsive Disorder, which I'll abbreviate OCD. Uh, this is relevant to both of the last chapters in uh, the current unit in Unit 5. It's relevant to the chapter on behavioral disorders. It's relevant to the chapter on the treatment of behavioral disorders. This is my outline for my little talk. Uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. I'll talk about what are obsessive thoughts, what are compulsive behaviors. I'll talk about treatment for OCD, cognitive behavioral therapy, and also drug therapy. We'll talk about the brain structures and neurotransmitters that are related to OCD. And I will have you watch a seven minute video called The Science of How OCD Works. As is usually the case, you're gonna expect one or two questions on our upcoming test to deal with that video. Let's dive right into the basics of OCD. Um, as the name would suggest, it consists of two components, obsessive thoughts and compulsive behaviors. I'll have a lot more to say about both obsessive thoughts and compulsive behaviors in a moment. Uh, how common is it? Uh, researchers tell us it affects about 2.3% of the population at some point in their lives at a given point in time, you could expect about 1.2% of the population displays symptoms of OCD at any given point in time. Incidence seems to be the same in men and women. What causes OCD? Nobody can say for sure. There appears to be a genetic component to it. Twin studies show that the concordance rate is higher among identical twins than it is among fraternal twins. Uh, and that is the signature of a disorder that probably has a genetic component. Uh, beyond that, there's no real consensus as to what causes OCD. Back when I went over the outline, I said that I would go into some detail in talking about the two components of OCD, obsessive thoughts and compulsive behaviors. Let's start with obsessive thoughts. How can we define obsessive thoughts? They are... Persistent thoughts, which the person dwells on, even though he or she sees them as irrational. Now, you've heard me talk about this before when we talked about phobias. People might be phobic about things that you and I would not be phobic about. Doesn't mean these individuals are delusional. And the same thing applies with OCD. Some of the beliefs that we're going to talk about as I go through this lecture are going to sound kind of crazy. But remember, the people with OCD are not delusional, they're not psychotic. They recognize that some of the beliefs that they hold are irrational. Very often they wish they didn't hold those beliefs, uh, but they do dwell on them. Uh, what are some popular irrational beliefs that are displayed by folks with OCD? Things like this. The world is filled with dangerous germs. We'll see that a common focus of OCD is a fear of dirt and germs and contamination. Sometimes people will go to bizarre lengths in order to protect themselves from dirt and germ contamination. At the heart of that is the obsessive thoughts, the fear that the world is filled with dangerous germs. Um, some folks are concerned about causing harm to themselves or to objects or property. If I leave this appliance turned on all day long while I'm at the office, my house will burn down. Now, this might be something to worry about if you've left the uh, iron on, the iron that you use to iron your clothes. But really, if you left the hallway lights on, is that going to burn the house down? Uh, they'll acknowledge that that's kind of an irrational thing to believe, and yet that's the way they feel. They'd feel a lot better if they could go back to the house and check and make sure they turned off that hallway light. 
Um, a lot of times these irrational beliefs focus on the fear of harming somebody else. What if I accidentally poisoned my children? Uh, what if some morning, instead of putting sugar on my children's cereal like I know I'm supposed to, I accidentally put rat poison on it and killed them? That would be terrible. Uh, well, that's not much likely to happen, and yet these folks might go to some uh, extreme lengths to make sure that nothing like that does happen. Now, these are all obsessive thoughts. We haven't got to the compulsive part of it yet. We haven't gotten to the kind of crazy behaviors that they might engage in in order to defend themselves against these obsessive thoughts. But the one component that we've talked about so far is the obsessive thoughts, the persistent thoughts that they dwell on, persistent thoughts which torture them. If you are plagued by obsessive thoughts like that, you'll probably want to do something about it, and that is where the second component of OCD comes in. The second component of OCD is the compulsive behavior. Uh, we can find compulsive behavior this way. Compulsive behavior is a useless, repetitive act that the person is unable to inhibit. It's also often performed in order to reduce the anxiety that's caused by their obsessions. And these compulsive behaviors often take the form of a ritual. Now, not only do I have to engage in this behavior, but I have to engage in this behavior in a particular way to protect myself from feeling anxious. We'll see some specific examples of the kinds of compulsive behaviors people with OCD might engage in. Now, theoretically, OCD could focus on any kind of obsessive thought and compulsive behavior. In practice, the majority of people with OCD can be classified into one of two families. Now, there's exceptions to this, but the two big families of OCD are, number one, the checkers. These are the people that are plagued by the fear that they left a door unlocked and that's going to allow a burglar to get into the house. These are the people that are plagued by the fear that they left the Mr. Coffee turned on all day and it's going to burn the house down. Uh, so the checkers are the ones that are going to compulsively check things like, uh, are the doors locked? I need to be sure of that. Are the appliances all turned off? Students in my class, they've heard me say that I have OCD. I do okay as long as I take my medication and do my exposure and response prevention therapy. Uh, but I fall into this first category, the checkers. I d first developed OCD when I was in my 30s. I was at another university down in South Carolina. At one point, my wife and I were renting a big house that actually had like seven doors to the outside. And so I'd check each of those doors before we would go to bed at night. And with passage of time, I found myself spending more and more time checking those doors. It might take me seven minutes to get around, 10 minutes to get around and check all the doors. I might be in bed and not be convinced that I really checked door number four adequately and I'd get out of bed and go check it again. Uh, now, this was no mystery to me. I've been teaching general psychology for years at that point. I knew exactly what I had. I knew it was OCD. Uh, and because I knew what it was, I went to my family doctor, described the situation. Uh, he, in turn, sent me to a psychiatrist, got me set up, and eventually got on behavioral therapy that helped me a lot. Uh, I fell into that first category, the category of the checkers. That's not the only category. The only other big category I've already alluded to, other big category of people with OCD are the washers. These are the ones that are obsessed with the fear of dirt and germs and contamination. One of the primary things they do in order to allay their anxiety about contamination is wash their hands. They're obsessed with the fear that they've got germ on their hands, and so they wash their hands a lot in order to keep their hands clean and make the anxiety go away. With a lot of these psychological disorders that I've talked about, I've tried to give you at least one case study. So I looked up this case study of a person that suffered from OCD, and he was a washer. Um, the abnormal psych textbook that I got this out of referred to him as Stephen. Came in for therapy at age 29. His wife complained of his excessive hand washing behavior. Sometimes these people come in of their own volition because they're in a lot of distress and they want to be in less distress. And sometimes they come in because they're pressured by a spouse or some other loved one. Uh, his wife complained about his obsessive hand-washing behavior. Uh, like most folks that are hand-washers, 
He was obsessed with a fear of germs and contamination. His wife complained about it. He had this ritual for washing his hands. It involved running the water for 15 minutes and soaping up his hands in a particular way and doing things in a certain order. Um, at the end of the ritual, he'd turn the water off with his elbows. If he accidentally touched something in the middle of this ritual, he would have to start all over again, which is common to folks that have OCD. Um, he, instead of fighting this, he kind of gave into it. And there's more and more things that he did not want to touch. He got to where he did not want to touch doorknobs because who knows who touched the doorknobs. There could be germs on them. Um, he didn't like to use his own front door because it could have germs on it. Eventually, he asked his wife to open the door for him, going and coming, so he didn't have to deal with it. Eventually, toward the end, he started entering and exiting his home using the windows. Hardly anybody goes in and out of the house using windows, so it's probably got a lot fewer germs on it. He found himself doing that. It was around that time that the wife suggested, maybe you need to talk to somebody about this issue. Sometimes folks that have this form of OCD will wind up in an emergency room and they have uh, infections in their hands because they wash their hands so frequently that they get dry and chapped and eventually get infected and that sends them to the emergency room and a seasoned physician in the emergency room uh, can recognize the signs of somebody that's been washing their hands uh, 200 times a day for the past couple of months and very often they'll bring up the possibility that this is a psychiatric disorder and hopefully get the person to see somebody that can give them some relief. And by the way, that's one of the reasons I like to talk about OCD is because uh, therapists have a really high success rate in treating OCD. Most of the folks that have it uh, when they eventually go in for therapy, they could kick themselves for having waited so long and having suffered for so long. In fact, that's a nice segue to our next topic. Next topic is treatment for OCD. This is one of the disorders that has uh, one of the higher success rates. You have a smorgasbord of treatments that you can select from if you suffer from OCD. First thing I'm going to talk about is a cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, years ago, they just referred to what I'm about to talk about as behavioral therapy. In recent decades, therapists have recognized, that, look, there's a big cognitive component to this. And so now there's an awful lot of therapies that go under the general heading cognitive behavioral therapy, or abbreviated uh, CBT. If uh, you're a psych major and if you go into some kind of helping profession where giving therapy is a part of it, uh, you'll hear that abbreviation CBT a lot. There's different kinds of CBT. The kind of CBT that is typically used to treat obsessive compulsive disorder is called exposure and response prevention therapy. Uh, this is pretty much what it sounds like. It involves exposing yourself to the thing that makes you afraid and then preventing yourself from giving your usual compulsive response for some period of time. Uh, you expose yourself to the thing you're afraid of, prevent yourself from giving the usual response. You stretch out the period of time that uh, you force yourself to go before you give your usual response. Um, let's give you a specific example of um, exposure and response prevention therapy. Let's imagine that you are Stephen, the guy that was the compulsive hand washer, and you're seeing a psychologist who's going to treat you with exposure and response prevention therapy. She might give you a small box uh, to carry around with you everywhere you go, a small box you can keep in your pocket. Uh, you pull it out five times per day, and when you open the box, inside is dirt, uh, dirt from the garden. Your instructions are five times per day. You pull out your box of dirt, rub the dirt on your hands and wrists, and at the beginning, you have to sit there for five minutes before you're allowed to go to the bathroom and wash your hands. Now, this may not seem like a big deal to you or me, but to somebody that has a bad phobia, a bad obsession about dirt and germs and contamination, it's excruciating to sit there with this dirt on their hands. Uh, there could be, there could be uh, HIV in that dirt. There could be 
hepatitis in that dirt. Uh, your five minutes are up, so finally you can run to the bathroom and wash your hands. You do this for a week. At the end of that week, we bump up the time period. Now, you don't have to wait five minutes. You have to wait 15 minutes. So we're stretching out the length of time between the time you put the dirt on your hands and the time that you're allowed to go to the bathroom and wash your hands. And once again, it's excruciating. Then the following week, we bump it up to 45 minutes. And so it goes. Week by week, they bump up the period of time that you have to wait before you're allowed to give your usual response of washing your hands. But as the weeks tick by, you find that it's bothering you less and less. The first time you had to put dirt on your hands, it was horrible to sit there and feel the contamination on your hands. But after two or three weeks of this, it didn't bother you that much. You were becoming desensitized to it. Um, and with the passage of time, the time eventually comes that you can spread dirt on your hands and it doesn't bother you much at all. You don't much care whether you go to the bathroom and wash your hands at all, unless you're doing some kind of work with paper that you don't want to get uh, dirt on the paper. Uh, but the point is, with the passage of time, you become desensitized to it. You have forced your brain to recognize that you can have dirt on your hands and it's not going to kill you. Uh, your brain thought that having dirt on your hands was going to kill you because you never forced it to confront the possibility of having dirt on its hands for a long period of time and finding out that it doesn't kill you. Uh, with this exposure response prevention therapy, your brain is forced to learn this lesson. In a period of week, the anxiety levels are usually much lower. The person can go through their life in a normal way. They no longer have to wash their hands 200 times a day. That's exposure and response prevention therapy. Uh, it's a popular form of cognitive behavioral therapy used to treat OCD. And yes, I use this. It's part of my uh, re regular regimen for treating, maintaining uh, the treatment of my OCD. In addition to that, I also use the second big strategy that's used to treat OCD. Uh, I'm on an antidepressant. And I've been on an antidepressant for years. I'll probably be on antidepressant forever. Um, antidepressants, some antidepressants, are effective in treating OCD. Now, this came as a surprise. Um, psychiatrists learned this a couple of decades ago. They didn't expect it to be the case. Uh, the situation was uh, some folks that have OCD also suffer from depression. In fact, among the people that have OCD, there's a higher than average likelihood that they'll suffer from depression. So a psychiatrist is seeing somebody that has both depression and OCD. Psychiatrist doesn't know what to do about the OCD, but puts them on an antidepressant medication uh, to treat the depression. The person comes back a month later and they say, I feel better, I'm not as depressed as I was before. And you know what? I don't have that compulsion to wash my hands as often as I used to. Uh, at the beginning, nobody expected this. Uh, but it was subsequently confirmed that, yeah, antidepressant medications, some of them at least, are in fact effective in treating OCD. In a second, we'll talk about why that might be. Uh, not just any antidepressant does. There is actually a kind of a long list of antidepressant medications that work. But among those that's effective in treating OCD is anaphronil and Zoloft. Now, as long as we're talking about antidepressant medications... Let's talk about why maybe they help with OCD. That segues to our next topic, brain structures and neurotransmitters that are related to OCD. Um, you remember back in, I believe it was Unit 2, you learned about brain structures. And I said some of these are particularly important because they'll come up in subsequent chapters of the, of the textbook and we're at such a point right now. Now here's a structure that I did not lecture on and you weren't responsible for back when you studied the biological basis of uh, behavior early in the semester, but it's important now because we're talking about OCD. A structure that appears to play an important role in OCD is the caudate nucleus. 
Uh, in folks that have OCD, when the OCD is not treated, it's hyperactive. It lights up in an fMRI machine. It's more active than it should be. It's not entirely clear why this is so. Uh, one speculation is because people with OCD have too little serotonin in that part of their brain. Uh, one of the reasons that people investigated this possibility is because it was established years ago that the antidepressant medications that effectively treat OCD are also the antidepressant medications that increase levels of serotonin uh, in those parts of the brain. Uh, so, caudate nucleus is relevant to OCD. Uh, the neurotransmitter serotonin is relevant to it. Uh, there's speculation that folks that have OCD maybe have too little serotonin in specific parts of the brain. And that is going to be an issue brought up in a video that I'm going to have you watch. It's not going to be part of this video because I don't own the copyright to it, but I'm going to show you the link uh, in a minute and it'll take you straight to the video and you can watch it. The video is called The Science of How OCD Works. It's about seven minutes long. It talks about the nature of obsessive compulsive disorder. What are the symptoms of OCD? They show you some clips from theatrical release movies, uh, one of which was the movie Aviator that some of you may have seen. It was a biopic of the millionaire Howard Hughes, a uh, very successful aviator, very successful in all kinds of different um, uh, career paths. Unfortunately for him, he also suffered from OCD. Also unfortunate for him, because he was filthy rich, nobody could tell him that you've got OCD, you need to get it treated, you need to straighten up. So instead, uh, he just uh, gave into his OCD. Uh, he structured his life in order to avoid dirt and germs and such, uh, and it led to him living a miserable life during the latter part of his life. It's kind of a a uh, cautionary tale of what happens when you give in to certain psychological disorders. So you'll see some clips from The Aviator in there. It's Leonardo DiCaprio. Uh, I like to show this video because they show some graphs where they talk about what brain areas are involved in OCD. Uh, they talk about the treatment of OCD. As is always the case, you can expect at least one question on the upcoming test to be based on this video. Here's the question I want you to have in mind as you watch it. In people with OCD, what happens to the caudate nucleus after following Dr. Jeffrey Swartz's behavioral therapy? Uh, does his therapy cause the caudate nucleus to become more active? Or does it cause it to become less active? I've uh, shown a little clip of uh, Jeffrey Swartz in this video. He is one of the psychiatrists that first became well known for writing a book that was very helpful for people in self-treating their own ACD. I showed a little clip of him uh, where he's making a presentation and you'll see um, a PowerPoint slide of fMRI brain uh, scan showing what the brain activity looked like before going through his therapy and what it looked like afterward. Um, if you're looking at the document that has these lecture notes, then the link, uh, the link to the video, um, The Science of OCD, uh, is this link. You can right-click it if you're using Windows machine, go to the video, watch the video for seven minutes, get your answer to the question, and then come back and resume this video because I've got some more notes that I want to give. There's certain parts of uh, the video that you're about to watch that I want to slow down and talk about them in some detail to make double sure that uh, you got the learning points that I want in that video. So stop this video, watch the science of OCD, and then come back to mine. And now you have watched the science of OCD. The question that I wanted you to have in mind as you watch the video, in people with OCD, what happens to the caudate nucleus after following Jeffrey Swartz's behavioral therapy? Does it cause the caudate nucleus to become more active or less active? The answer is in the video. I expected you to watch that video, and if you did, you'll be able to answer that question. Uh, so I'm not going to fill in the blank on that one particular question, but I do want to give you some more notes because there's a lot of great information in the video that you just watched, and because it's a seven-minute video, it comes at you so fast, 
I'm not sure that everybody would be able to absorb and benefit from that information. So I'm going to go back and show you a couple of screen captures from his video and um, amplify some of the points that he was making. Uh, some of the points made by the video. You don't have to memorize the following brain structures that I'm about to talk about, but yes to the caudate nucleus. I do want you to know what happens to the functioning of caudate nucleus after undergoing uh, Jeffrey Swartz's therapy. Does it become more active or less active? Um, I like to show this capture from the video that you watched because it provides a lot of information in one PowerPoint slide. For example, let's imagine, uh, let's imagine to begin with that you don't have OCD, which most of you do not. You don't have OCD, but you're out in the backyard throwing the ball for the dog. Your hands get dirty in the course of that. It occurs to you that there's a lot of dog poop in the backyard, so maybe some of that dog poop is on your hands, and you realize, I really should go inside and wash my hands before I do anything else. So, your hands are dirty, you need to wash them. It causes some anxiety that, yeah, I really don't want to have uh, dog poop on my hands when I do the things I'm going to do today. What's going on in the brain of a normal person uh, when this scenario unfolds? Well, uh, the orbital cortex is involved. Orbital cortex is part of your brain that's monitoring the environment. It recognizes something's wrong. I've got dirt on my hands. Uh, the cingulate uh, gyrus is involved as well. You feel kind of anxious. You realize I could have dog poop on my hands uh, when I have my snack an hour and a half from now. That wouldn't be good. That makes me feel kind of gross and kind of anxious. So you feel bad about that. Uh, you wash your hands, and this is where the caudate nucleus comes in. You wash your hands, and in fact, let's go to the next slide. How this anxiety is resolved in a person without OCD, and this graphic was in the video that you watch, uh, watched as well. Uh, you've washed your hands, caudate nucleus is monitoring what's going on, and it's as if the caudate nucleus is that structure in the brain that tells you uh, you're out of danger. There's nothing to worry about. If you're a normal individual that does not have OCD, the caudate nucleus gives you the all clear message. I've washed my hands. My hands are clean now. I can go to my next task. Uh, sit down at the computer and respond to some emails. You don't feel anxious. You feel fine because you don't have OCD. But what if you did have OCD? Uh, if you had OCD, the one structure that is most likely implicated in what's about to happen is the caudate nucleus. The problem with those folks that have OCD is all of these structures in this chain become hyperactive. All of them have gone on full alert. And in particular, because the caudate nucleus has become hyperactive, you're getting this warning signal from your brain. Uh, I tell people to think of the caudate nucleus as being sort of like a smoke detector. If there's smoke in the room, caudate nucleus goes off and it tells you something's wrong. You need to do, about, do something about this. Now, everybody has this smoke detector in their brain. And with most of us, once we've cleared the smoke out of the room, a uh, smoke detector stops going off and we're fine. But if you have OCD, even after you've cleared the smoke out of the room, the caudate nucleus keeps going off. The smoke detector keeps beeping even though there's no smoke in the room. The caudate nucleus does not give you the all clear signal because it's hyperactive. It keeps sending you this warning signal even though there's no danger in the room to worry about. So, problem with the individual with OCD, all of these structures become hyperactive. You constantly feel as if something's wrong even when nothing is wrong. And this is where therapy comes in video that I had you just watch focused, among other things, on Jeffrey Swartz. He's the guy that wrote the book Brain Lock. Brain Lock is a brilliant name for a book about OCD because it's exactly what it feels like. Your brain gets locked in this activity and has a hard time breaking itself out of it. Uh, Jeffrey Swartz, author of Brain Lock, has developed a widely used behavioral treatment. He calls it his four-step behavioral treatment. Uh, in the video, they showed presentation being made by Jeffrey Swartz, uh, where he is showing to the audience an fMRI image of a brain both before and after therapy. His slide that he shows in the video 
uh, illustrates that there's decreased activity in the caudate nucleus after undergoing several weeks of his behavioral treatment that he came up with. And here is a capture of that PowerPoint slide that Dr. Swartz showed in the video that you just watched. Uh, this is a slice of the brain looking at it from the front. Uh, under pre, this is what brain activity looked like before undergoing uh, Jeffrey Swartz's four-step treatment for, um, for treating OCD, for treating brain locked. Uh, RCD is used to identify the right caudate nucleus. Notice there's a lot of yellow and a lot of red here. That means a lot of activity. Caudate nucleus is involved in a lot of activity when the person has OCD and has not undergone any kind of therapy for it. Uh, however, what does the label say? The change in energy use after drug-free self-treatment with Dr. Swartz's four-step method post after several weeks of therapy. Notice there's a lot less yellow there is no red at all in this area, indicating that there is less activity in the right caudate nucleus after undergoing several weeks of Swartz's behavioral therapy. Uh, this change, it's a dramatic physiological change, right? A lot of activity here, very little activity there. This change is not due to medication. Uh, this change is due to nothing but behavioral therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, I referred to Jeffrey Swartz's book. I make the note, uh, go to Amazon and type in OCD or treating OCD, and you'll find there's a million books on how to treat yourself with OCD, and many of them are very good. Uh, Jeffrey Swartz's book is uh, well regarded. It's a relatively old book compared to some of the things you'll find on the market now. Uh, more recently, I've been using something called the OCD Workbook, and I liked it a lot because it's very concrete, and you don't have to do a lot of background reading in order to dive right into coming up with a self-therapy uh, regimen for treating your OCD. Uh, so I like that book a lot, but if you have OCD, go to Amazon.com and you'll only find about a million books that can be effective in self-treatment of OCD. Um, some final comments on this topic. Uh, this is likely to be the last video that I give for Psych 100 this semester. How come OCD? Well, in part, it's because I told you at the beginning of the semester, uh, I have OCD, and I would mention it again at later points in the semester where it's relevant, and this is the place where it's relevant. Um, I also like to talk about OCD here at the end of the semester because it's representative of the state of affairs with a lot of psychological disorders. A lot of psychological disorders involve emotional and behavioral symptoms that are experienced by the individual. Somebody tells you that I'm anxious, I feel scared all the time. And maybe that's not real impressive, uh, that maybe that doesn't impress you much when somebody that you know says that. But most of us are more impressed if we can see some kind of physical evidence that something is going on in this individual's brain. And now that we have this advanced imaging technology like PET scans and fMRI, we can see that obsessive compulsive disorder also involves problems involving functioning of specific structures in the brain, problems that can now be imaged using fMRI and PET scan and such. Uh, more impressive, we now know that we can affect the functioning of these structures through cognitive behavioral therapy, not by injecting people with drugs, but by having them go through a daily regimen of self-treatment, we can image actual changes in the functioning of specific parts of the brain uh, that you can see on a computer screen. Uh, that's impressive. That's something that 80 years ago, uh, not only could people probably not have imagined, they probably wouldn't believe it would even happen. that You could have people just do some kind of behavioral therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, and you can actually observe changes in the functioning of the brain. Uh, kind of the message, the take-home message from uh, what they've learned about OCD is if you suffer from OCD, 
do your therapy, do your cognitive behavioral therapy, and not only will your symptoms get better, but we'll actually be able to see changes in brain functioning using fMRI and other technology. Uh, this gives us all kinds of reasons for optimism for those that suffer from OCD and those that suffer from other psychological disorders as well. Uh, the story of the last 100, 150 years has been a tremendous success and not only understanding uh, the nature of psychological disorders, but understanding how we can effectively treat them and how we can conduct effective research uh, to determine where we're, whether we're successful in treating it or not. Uh, we had great success in treating OCD, great success in treating anxiety disorders, uh, great success in treating depression. There's every reason to believe we're gonna have similar kinds of success in treating other psychological disorders as well. Uh, that's a very optimistic thought, and I thought that was a nice thought for me to end the semester on. So that's the end of my lecture notes for Module 3. This is likely the last of the video lectures that I'll be sending for this semester. Uh, do keep your eye out for emails from me. I'll send you reminders when deadlines are coming up. I'll send you reminders when we're about to do our online review session uh, to get you ready for test number 5.